Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at OneSpid with Jörg Grosse, who's going to look at the statistical underpinnings of standards like ISO 26262. Jörg, what have we drawn out here? So, Ed, uh, let's say we have uh, an MCU inside the vehicle, and that MCU um, performs a safety-relevant function. And let's further assume that we have attached an ASL uh, B level um, to this device. Mm -hmm. So our device uh, is a small MCU, it has a CPU in it, it has an SRAM and some I.O. functions. Uh, to be compliant with uh, the hardware architectural metrics required by the ISO 262 standard, we have to fulfill what's called the single point fault metric. And I will walk you quickly through what the single point fault metric means. So we have lambda, Lambda is the failure rate of the device. So down here we have the total lambda of this device. So how many times would the device fail uh, in the field due to random error? Uh, on, on top of here, we, uh, on top here we have the uh, what's called lambda for the uh, multipoint faults plus lambda for the safe faults. Multipoint faults are actually related to uh, detected faults. So whenever we have what's called safety mechanisms in our chip and a safety mechanism has detected a random fault, it would fall into the multipoint fault bucket. So what is a multipoint fault? What happens there? So multipoint fault is um, the fault happens, let's say, in the SRAM then we do have a safety mechanism which actually detects that fault and then the fault gets either corrected or it might alert the driver or it might put the car into a safe state and it could be for example that the car just starts parking. Most of when we search for faults, particularly with formal, um, we look for a single point fault. You're looking at here a multi-point fault. That's still the single point fault metric because inside the single point fault metric, the multi point fault metric are actually the good ones. So we already consider them as being detected from a hardware IC standpoint. And as you can see from the formula, we're taking uh, the multi point faults plus the safe faults, and the larger this fraction is, the better our metric becomes. Uh, why don't you explain some of the safety mechanisms here? Okay, so. Let's start with the easy one, we have an SRAM. Actually, in most microcontrollers, SRAMs are already protected by, uh, for example, parity or some error correction code. Um, they are really handsome safety mechanisms because they are small, they don't need uh, a lot of additional logic, and once we verify them, um, then we can assume a high coverage, for example, our SRAM. So all the area which is taken by the SRAM is pretty much protected if we have an ECC correction or a parity. How do you verify that's correct? So um, what we do here is um, we either could simulate like standard uh, UVM verification, but uh, formal technology is actually quite suited for the verification of hardware safety mechanisms because the nature of formal is that it is exhaustive and therefore we can verify that under all possible input stimulus and under all fault scenarios, that uh, the safety mechanism works correctly. So what happens in I.O.? Um, most I.O. protocols have end-to-end -end protection built in, uh, like standard UART already has some end-to-end -end protection. And um, if we are not happy with that end-to-end -end protection, we can also build in some redundancy into the software layer. So for example, we could send uh, a frame twice and compare that we receive the same values. Will this uh, statistical approach apply to every failure that we see? Does it catch everything? Stepping back to the RAM, you can easily imagine that every single fault inside the RAM would be corrected with, um, for example, depending on the, on the design of the, of the error correction, but typically it's around 99%. So as I said, if we verify that correctly, we can assume for the area and all the faults inside the RAM, 99% uh, detection rate. Is 99% good enough or do we have to go higher than that? Yeah, the goal for an ASL-B device for the single point fault metric is actually 90%.
How about for other safety standards that are out there, are similar? It's, it's similar, but the ISO standard is really explicit about the numbers. Um, so for example, if you design an ASLD device, you have to reach 99% and you can imagine that's pretty tough. So ASLB is the automotive standard, correct? Right, that's correct. And are, there's also a C and a D. How do they impact here? So C are actually C and D are, have higher demands on the on the metrics. Uh, most people do either B or C. It's kind of interesting. Um, you can observe that in the field. So C is actually pretty rare. Um, and for the single point fault metric, the requirement for ASL D is 99%. So theoretically, this should all be safe, and when we get autonomous vehicles on the road that adhere to all these standards, everything, at least the components, should work just fine. Yes. With a uh, certain likelihood, we actually um, investigate with our hardware architectural metrics. So CPUs typically have been the most challenging. What different there? So CPUs... Um, they don't have a regular structure like an SRAM and you can imagine it's hard to build an end-to-end -end protection into a CPU. So what people do is, for example, they design uh, what's called a dual-core lockstep. So in fact, they're instantiating the CPU twice and have a comparison at the output. And whenever the two CPUs behave differently, um, that, that would raise an alarm. So therefore, a fault would be detected. But as you can imagine, that's a pretty expensive um, safety mechanism because we're just doubling the area um, for the CPU. Yeah. A different alternative is we write a software self-test for the CPU. That's a program which runs periodically on the CPU and can also detect faults. So basically we are writing uh, two operands into a register, add them up, and expect a certain result. Yeah. This is different than the way avionics does things, right? I mean, avionics used to have, what, a couple computers and the, or several computers, and, and they would throw out the one that doesn't match? Yeah. So, in avionics, it's actually uh, even stricter. So, in avionics, uh, what, what's been typically done is triple redundancy, and they even require that uh, the that, uh, three systems are designed differently. And only if two agree, then you have a good result. There's a, something called software self-testing which goes on here too, right? What is that? That's correct. So we're asking our software engineer to come up with a program which tests the CPU on the fly. You can imagine that program, the shorter the better, because it has to be run periodically on the device and it takes up compute resources. The trouble with those uh, software self-tests is it is pretty hard to achieve 90% um, coverage with such a, a software self-test. Um, so people or software engineers struggle um, with coming up with a good set of tests for the CPU. Is part of that the fact that there are just so many potential interactions there that we can't really get a hold of them all? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, we have... Um, we, we typically do this uh, on a gate-level netlist and you have large cones of combinatorical logic. How do you come up with all the right operands to actually activate a fault in the system, propagate a fault, and then compare it against an expected result? Because we've seen in other devices where sometimes a series of events will create an error which you don't necessarily understand until they go in a certain sequence. So there are lots of different possibilities, right? Exactly. And if you will, so we are back 20 years uh, when we start, when we did start writing tests, manufacturing tests. So we started doing this by hand, by creating some input stimulus, but at some point in time we realized that's not sustainable. So it got very hard. So we invented, for example, scan chains to ease that problem. And this is a very similar problem here we are facing for the CPU. You know, one of the big issues that we've been wrestling with in, in a lot of these uh, tests is coverage. Uh, how do you actually assure that you've got good coverage with the software self-test? So what we do is um, we do traditional fault simulation today. So we have uh, a fault population. So these are all our uh, faults inside our CPU. We 
put that into a fault simulator. And out comes a classification. So we have, let's say, a good chunk of faults which are okay, so they did propagate and so therefore they, uh, they caused the program to behave differently and we consider them as being detected. But then, uh, as already mentioned, we have a quite a big chunk of faults where we just don't know whether they're propagating or maybe they can't even propagate because they are in debug logic and the debug logic is switched off. Um, so what are we going to do with those faults? So what we see actually that engineers really um, open up um, a debugger or um, a netless debugger and look at the faults individually and try to figure out if this fault, for example, can propagate or not. And that's a very time consuming task. And that's the big problem here, right, is you need to be able to do this well enough in a reasonable amount of time. Right, exactly. So what our goal is actually we want to understand at least uh, this fraction here because we want to reach our 90% target. So the, the problem with fault simulation at that point is that the fault simulator uh, cannot help us here anymore because the fault simulator just says it's non-propagatable. So what we can do here uh, is apply again formal technology because formal has this exhaustive nature. It can explore all possible input stimulus. We would take those faults and put them into a formal tool. And the formal tool then can either say the fault is safe because under, under uh, no circumstance uh, the fault can propagate dangerously that's one good outcome. And the other outcome would be that the fault can propagate. So when the fault propagates, the, um, the software engineer is not left alone at that moment because when the formal tool um, manages to propagate the fault, it gives you what it's called a counterexample. And with that counterexample, the engineer can understand what test pattern he has to write in order to propagate and detect the fault. So really, it's understanding things well enough to know when the exceptions are okay and when they're not. You're really trying to understand what the faults do. Right, and it gives you a simulation trace like you're used to uh, with your waveform debugger. So it gives you a trace, tells you in order to activate the fault, you have to provide these input stimulus. And to propagate it further, you have to write those registers. Then the fault propagates to here and there and, and so on. And that's very valuable for the software engineer to understand how to improve the test program. So what's good enough? I mean, that, that's always been the big question in verification is, when do you get to the point where you think it's good enough for, and, and you're comfortable enough for sign off? That's determined by the requirements from the standard. So we talked about our 90% target. So if we, I would recommend for, for an ASO B device to achieve maybe a little bit more than 90% uh, for the CPU, then you're a little bit on the safe side. Um, but that's, that's, as I said, right? That's, the, uh, it's, it's much easier than in, than in standard verification where you're tracking the back rate, etc. So you have all this um, closed loop uh, coverage. Uh, here it's easier. Once we reached our 90%, we're done. 